。哦，大家早上好。呃，首先谢谢那个北美馆，还有那个村子呃村子呃基金会蒋伯兴教授的那个邀请呃，来参加这次会。那个呃，真的很荣幸我呃呃介绍那个呃就是江苦乐教授，因为他的呃讲话是呃是用那个英语，所以我就用英语介绍。It's my honor to introduce uh Professor uh John Clark. John Clark uh, uh, is the Professor Emeritus in Art History at the University of Sydney. He is an, uh, certainly an authority in study of uh, modern Asian art. Uh, he has numerous publications. If I read the, only read the title of all publications, it may take hours. So I, here I only introduce a few publications to you. Uh, his uh, Asian modern, Modernity uh, Modernities, Chinese and uh, Thai art of the 1980s and 1990s, published in 2010, is a pioneer work in the cross-disciplinary inter-Asian uh, com uh, comparison of the modern art and art, art worlds. And this book won uh, the best art book prize of the Art Association of Australia and uh, New Zealand in uh, 2011. He also published back-to-back -back books by Brio, uh, in uh, 2010 and uh, 2013 is the modernity of the Chinese art and the modernity of Japanese art. He also recently uh, completed a draft of the two volumes, the Asian modern, uh, the 1850 to 1890s, uh, which include the detailed comparative compar studies of more than 25 Asian artists in five generations between the 1850s and the 1990s. Uh, also, I have two volumes of the materials for the artist. Uh, uh, so this is a very important uh, publication. We will uh, look forward to it. His compared, uh, con con uh, contemporary Asian art at Biennials, which includes a special chapter on, chi on China at Biennials, is scheduled to publish by the National University of Singapore pr Press uh, in, in this year. Professor. Uh, uh, Clark is also uh, very active the, in the, uh, the curatorial uh, field. He co-authored, uh, co-curated uh, the modern boy and modern girls, the modernity in Japanese art, 1910 to 1935, at the art gallery of the New, New South Wales in 1998, and in, 19, uh, in 2014, is also co-curated an exhibition of the work of the area uh, Rastage in uh, Sydney and. Uh, uh, Canberra. Today his talk, uh, the title of his talk is uh, The Archive in Time, Temporal Frames in the History of the Asian Modern. Professor John Clark. So I'm going to use English. I believe a translation is in the process of production. So, uh, this is a, probably too complicated a topic for a public forum, but I'll try and read it reasonably slowly. And I've tried to clarify bits of it, which I thought might be a bit difficult for non-specialists. I, too, would like to thank the Taipei Fine Arts Museum and the Spring Foundation for inviting me and for organizing this very impressive conference with lots of people who know each other here and there, all being brought into the same room. Uh, those of you who are not uh, in the speakers panel do corner some of the speakers because I can tell you they don't always appear in these sorts of conferences at the same time. I'd also like to, to thank Taipei for turning to spring today because the last two we okay? The last two days were the end of the Taipei winter, which seems to have extended from January through to April this year. Uh, and I have fairly wide experience of living in foreign cities, and I can tell you January and February is not when you want to be in Taipei. And so I'm very glad we got spring, and it's lovely. Um, now, I'm going to talk about time processes and think about the archiving contact, con contact connection to that. So there's three levels of problems really. One is what the Asian modern might be, the purpose of the archive, or the national, you know, with national inflection, the purpose of the archive in particular countries. Then there's a question of what the Asian modern is, 
And then there's a question of how we articulate these ideas with some recent thinking about time and time in art history. And I should say that this paper will be published or is scheduled anyway, for publication next year in a slightly different form um, so, uh, from um, Dan Carlholm and uh, Keith Moxie as editors. The Asian modern conceives of modern art in various Asian countries and cultural continuities, notice the difference, as articulating similar sets of developments which have analogies, common procedures, and sometimes, but not always, interlinked causalities, which are not always those found in Europe and North America, but which are still identifiably modern. If you want to know a little marker of how early the modern European art and the modern Asian art are interlinked. You only have to consider that Radin Saleh entertained a Malay scholar and Charles Baudelaire in his studio in Paris in the 1840s. So these are not separate, distant phenomena. It's just that we've, because of our particular kinds of emphasis, we've not actually looked for the linkages that are already there. But I'm not saying that they are all linked. They're certainly in parallel. These discourses form a separate Asian paradigm for constructing bearing modernisms, which in many cases is not only due to the transfer of the, those discourses of modernism from Euro-America, even if there were liminal causal processes, and chiefly Euro-American colonialism set it off, it seems. Now, this nomenclature, Euro-America and Euro-American, my North American publishers always insist on putting a hyphen between the Euro and the American, ignoring why we put them together. Help us to avoid attrib attributing origination or subsequent ownership of modern art to the West. We are not dealing with a Western, Eastern continuum of an old concept, an old binary. The Asian modern is a tremendously enabling frame which permits us to see where Asia has its own modernities of different types and necessary different causal procedures and allows artists the authority to follow their own culturally specific or culturally hybrid paths to modernity. It sets aside Euro-American critiques, and I've heard these mentioned in various places, that think looking at the Asian modern now is to misapply frames already outmoded in their space of origin, or which are rendered invalid because globalization has now both allowed and forced artists to go beyond the limitations of those spaces when the Euro-American modern was founded in the 1850s to 1860s. And as I already mentioned, they are even thus still linked together. Just we just don't know what those links are. In some cases, we haven't even tried to establish them. Okay. The Asian space is every bit as complex to construct and historically analyze as the Euro American one, not to mention the geographical extension of the Asian space and its historical longevities. But they are, as we know from the spread of Buddhism onwards, if not earlier. Buddhism to China and so forth. Uh, they are interlinked. The Asian modern itself has not yet achieved the recognized status of equivalent importance in Euro-America. Surely a basic requirement to the founding of any genuine world art history. Uh, art history deals with artworks and their makers, followed by their receivers and other mediators. It treats these, whether or not the artworks are physical or virtual, or the art makers authorial, somehow determining their own output, or whether, even, or, or whether those receiving the art can constitute an audience loop through which an author position is established, one which is sometimes taken as a putative author by a curator. What is the archive of works from which art historical knowledge constructs its understanding and from which artistic practice selects its references? A preoccupation of several scholars, including Hal Foster, due to the use of the archive by certain artists in New York, called ha one of whom is Hans Hacker. He is not so much with the contents of the archive instanced by contemporary artists, but with the archivality of their impulse, 
with the way in which they incorporate a reference to past objects or artworks into their present practice, some of whom, including our friend Wu Malia, are present in this room. It is the way the artist ordered the archive through the type of reference and the quasi-archival logic, a matrix of citation and juxtaposition, which shows the regulatory and leg legislative method of using an archive. I'm going to discuss, let me see if we can get our slides up. Yep, that's the first one. I'm going to discuss different works from three different times in recent Chinese pictorial culture which may allow an evidential focus and see what this analysis tells us about how concepts of time apply or allow art history to generate new kinds of meaning. But all the use of the archive, and we go to some more there, these three works, essentially the uh, Rambonian and then the Pan Yuliang and Zhang Peili following it, all, of the, all the use of archive requires the use of temporal concepts. And very often this is left off the consideration of archive, which is why I've made quite a point of it today. The me temporal concepts have method have a method or have seem to have a methodological neutrality, but we cannot assume this, nor can we assume the cultural domain of their application is out of the question. So we have to think about how the concepts are used, what the concepts say, and where they come from. The comprehension and representation of time and space has occupied several minds, a literature which is too large to review, particularly in Western European sources. The Euro-American debates are greatly indebted to St. Augustine, who forms the basis for Osborne's recent excursions in this field. And I shall abbreviate some of my extensive citations that are in the text and will be translated for you later. Um, a part of what Wasman says is, indeed, the abstract temporal formation, formalism of the time of modernity, of which avant-garde and the contemporary are specific trans transformative articulations, is itself a projection into history of just such a fundamentally subjective temporality. And now, it's very useful. We have actually got a text, a systematic, and perhaps to some Right, readers, a provocative non-Euro-American analysis of time by an Indian scholar called C.K. Raju, who notes the intervention of Christian theology into the structuring of time uh, as scientific concepts for causation, and which imposes a linear notion. Raju writes, unlike earlier rejections of quasi-cyclic time, the curse on cyclic time benefited the state by strengthening hierarchy. As propagated by Western theologians, linear time symbolizes the Christian view. Cyclic time, the primitive pagan view. Linear time represents progress and human freedom and so on, while cyclic time represents stagnant societies, fatalism. There's a distinguished philosopher of anthropology called Johannes Fabian, who also notes that Enlightenment thought marks the break with the essentially medieval, he's talking about Euro-America, of course, Christian or Judeo-Christian vision of time. There's a break but in the Enlightenment. The break was from a conception of time-space in terms of a history of salvation to one that ultimately re resulted in the secularization of time as natural history. Uh, and if we're to think of parts of modern paradigms as being found in many places, that's one of them. I'll repeat it, the secularization of time as natural history. Indeed, in, included in the pictures of time which Raju distinguishes in no particular sequence, we have superlinear time, irreversible time, mundane time, apolytic time, epistemically broken time, ontically broken time, where the material grounds of being uh, as opposed to its general and philosophically grounded ontological basis are opposed and supercyclic time. So there's lots of concepts of time involved in just the notion of time and maybe the, the purpose of this paper and the forthcoming book uh, by Moxie and Carl Holm is to draw attention to this issue. Obviously the solutions were not final and will take a long time to work out. The processes in which temporal concepts are used to denote or describe 
Euro-American art, particularly modernism and its avatars, are usually presented in interpretive exploration of temporal concepts and their causal implications. Sometimes diachrony diac is supposed to be absolute. One of the questions we should ask, or maybe ask more carefully, is how long did it take for a certain kind of art to become modern, or a certain kind of tendency to become representative of the modern? We could ask in East Asia, for example, was there an instantaneous grasp of surrealism, as we suppose, in the Japan of the 1920s? Well in advance of many parts of the world, by the way, uh, including the English-speaking world. Don't forget that the Breton surrealism et la peinture was translated into Japanese in 1930, but only into English in 1975, or thereabouts. So um, the, this is a serious question because we say this is, a, this is an Asian version of European surrealism or an Asian version of Cubism. Is it genuine because it's late? Is it genuine because it's not theirs or when they do it? Uh, just go forward. Compare these two pictures, only done two years apart by the same artist. One is clearly a sort of post cezannean phobism, maybe a bit of Cubism in it. Um, we don't need to go into the, the art history of those speculations that are covered by various books, even in English. And this variation of um, lightly colored Japanese nanga of the sort, sort of um, exploratory eccentric type. But they're the same artist, the same period virtually. So we're faced with lots of issues when we look at these paintings. Uh, because we, when we look at these paintings, we stop thinking that the technical effic efficacy of transfer needs to be conceived, as it is by most European uh, and American scholars, as a disturbance when it, the Euro American system is uh, adopted, and not simply the making of a new kind of art with multiple sources and conditions. Um, and this is found very very frequently on left and right, politically speaking, in Euro-America. On the left, for example, a little footnote in being on a book which tries to go beyond the notion of postmodernism by an, a writer whom I greatly admire, even says, the colonial processes which helped both for good and ill to deprive third world societies of a developed modernity have now largely yielded to the neo-colonial processes where those still partly pre-modern formations are sucked into the vortex of the West's post-modernity. Is that the only way of looking at it? I don't think so. This amounts to a highly problematic view, implicit a much, much lot, across a lot of debate, that any later form of modernity to which the artists refer requires the prior existence within the archive, this is the important use of the archive, which may represent a Euro-American type of modernity. So, Yorosa Tetsugoro's retake of Japanese Nanga on the right is irrelevant to his understanding of Cubism or late Phobism, Phobism, late Cubism. Uh, the chronology, of course, depends on one's appraisal of the Der Sturm print exhibition in, in Tokyo in 1910. Um, anyway, um, Contents, it seems to be the misapplication of temporal concepts. So it makes you think how important temporal concepts are. Let's look at three Chinese examples which may allow us to think about what temporality is, or I should say examples from the Chinese world. Since the first one, obviously, is a treaty port painter, spoil them, um, seems to correspond to a notion of time or may, may allow us to deploy a notion of time and modernity, which implies a radical break. There seems to be a connection with two instances of time which exist, but which the observer does not know, and ordinarily time evolution is broken by a sudden transition between two states, such as the change to the literati portrait effected by Renpo Nian in this picture of Wu Changshu, Wu Changshu, himself and a painter. The, the kind of break, sorry, the kind of break which is implied here, and I, the more you look at these two pictures, the more you realize the pose of the Western merchant to the Chinese artist is actually informing 
another kind of Chinese mentality, uh, discursive position for portraiture, I think, um, it, it implies a change in subject matter, but it implies a choice in interpretation about existing representations. Some of you who've read a bit of Chinese history will know the controversy caused in this city, indeed, by Sullivan in 1973, pointing out the references to Renaissance prints in uh, certain late Ming and early Qing paintings, and that was carried forward by James Cahill in a much more satisfactory manner, I think. Uh, in the relationship of the views of late Renaissance cities in prints to late Ming landscape representations, above all of Gongxian. Well, you may object to me using Chinese uh, tr treaty port paintings for these things, but the more you look at it, the more you see the unspoken topic of the early 19th century in Chinese painting history is exactly what commercial treaty port paintings by Chinese artists, what its impact was for other kinds of Chinese visual discourse. Uh, the impact of the break is much clearer in portraits. Fine literati gentlemen are separated from their supports in elegant studies or gardens and pressed into a character. You can almost see this uh, Wu Chang Shi or being forced, that this person's character is being forced into the, sub into the subject matter. Uh, he, his face, his forehead is no longer phrenologically constructed uh, and he looks at the picture al almost directly. Um, the, the, the problem with understanding this kind of painting, it seems to me as an outsider, perhaps or a non-specialist, is it's very often interpreted in terms of arrival of photography. Well, of course, it arrived long before photography in China in the case of the treaty port painters doing portraiture, or long before, relatively speaking, long before. 40 years, 40 or 50 years. So the first kind of temporal concept found in modern age is, is a one of rupture. Uh, the the uh, shift towards individually experienced every day. And it borrows heavily from visual representations without going into the history, which go back to Enlightenment portraiture in the late 18th century. It's very interesting how widespread this shift is in different parts of Asia if you look for it. For example, it's also found in Siam, or now called Thailand. And I'm not going to illustrate that here, but uh, just to mention that um, port views, illustrated books, illustrated compendia brought to, si brought to Siam in the 1840s or exchanged as diplomatic gifts in the 1850s and 1860s had a very strong effect on Chinese uh, paint, paint, uh, Thai painting. We also see something of the same kind of range of the character of subject forced into its physical frame in the portraits of missionary figures in the treaty boards. And uh, we can likewise think that in uh, the Canton Matau area of the 1780s to 1830s, whilst working in a non pictorial mode and technique, uh, the, the, some of the visual constructions of portscapes were extended both to local subjects and indeed, as we know, to had been had had for earlier incar inca incarnations in um, Suzhou prints of the 1840s and then these late Qing, uh, late Tish Qing paintings of the 1770s all on, on the wall in, in, the, in Beijing. Um, so the, the notion of modernity, may, you may say, in East Asia and uh, um, Southeast Asia involves a creating a notion of the corpus of works which is much broader than those works which are dignified either by a local genealogy, such as Wenrenhua, or by um, Buddhist mu mural paintings in the case of Thailand, much broader than that. And also includes folk painting, as we know in China, because of the way in which Suzhou prints became pictorial models for lots of non-literati painting, which I'm not detailing. A hybrid space. And that means we have to change the archive, because you have to include things in the archive. I'm not suggesting a full visual culture approach, but I am suggesting that lots of works have to be included in the archive, which aren't 
normally included in the same institutions of reception as we have them now. Um, the other notion of time which is very interesting is the notion of t time as mundane, where the notion of a lineage of a straight line of time suddenly comes to a branching point and then art goes in one direction or another and this is constrained by history but is also developed by the artist's own inclinations. In other words, when you look at the work of Pan Yuliang, a not terribly distinguished uh, Ecole de Paris painter, but all, all the same very interesting artist, you begin to be conscious in the 1840s, when she's living in France, of having left behind the hostile the world, the art world of Shanghai, which was so hostile to her, and then of course war with Japan and civil war, the longing perhaps for an imagined female utopia of self-enjoyment. Um, many of the his portraits of, of women uh, in the 1940s are pictures of pleasure, I just have to say, and again in the um, 50s and 60s when she was still working. Almost for the first time in Chinese painting history, the woman's body is a field of enjoyment in a female gaze, not a masculine gaze. And if you want to remember the difference, you have to just compare Pan Yuliang with a later picture by Gao Jianfu, again in Hong Kong, a highly open-minded painter, but essentially working with a woman's reflection of herself as she would have been seen by her male lover. So the even in later literati painting, the woman's gaze is still incorporated into a male construction. Unfortunately, these sorts of connections are never really discussed for Pan Yuliang. And uh, another problem with Pan Yuliang, which should be clear but isn't yet, or at least isn't clear to my satisfaction, let's put it that way, is that she was very interested in Russia and her chronologies all say that she went to Russia in 1942. Unfortunately, there was a war between Russia and Germany in 1942 and nobody's satisfactorily explained how she managed to get there. But anyway, she's given to have gone there. Um, so we get, even with artists who aren't revolutionaries, who aren't in any stylistically formal, formal sense, uh, avant-garde, um, but who are aware of the art discourse from which they are moving, we do get this split time uh, which involves very real choices for the artists, uh, let alone for the absent reception, because of course this work we're looking at was never exposed, the one on the left was never exposed in China in her lifetime. Um, another concept which, uh, which uh, our friend uh, Raju uses is what he calls super, super cyclic time, which he defines as nothing prevents the distant future from wrapping around the, the remote, going around back to the remote past. He does this by looking at counterfactual geometry and various theories of clocks. But um, I think, and I'll be trancing my arm here a bit, I think that's what Zhang Pei Li is doing with some of his repetitive works, particularly Te Hai, where the newsreader reads the words in the dictionary, Chinese dictionary with the water radical, ooh, the water radical, uh, in a repetitive manner. And in fact, John Paley didn't shoot this video. He got someone to shoot it for him in a studio. So the composition, in a certain sense, is, is entirely orthodox for a certain kind of TV news reading. In this kind of work, John Paley is suggesting that the future is a repetition of a past which traps, excludes, obfuscates the present. You are not allowed to live in the present. And of course part of the reason for that is the opposition, resistance, visceral hostility to Mao speak and its all, all its ideological guises. 
his mesmerizing, mesmerizing iteration of the newsreader has to be linked to, cannot be separated from repetition of mundane content in the newsreading format. So, and so it's, this, in, in the image of the news is so well known as to cons constitute a static time frame in itself. So the, 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 the future is somewhere over there, but it's being pushed back on us by the force of this uh, habitual convention. Uh, it provide, water provides the view with an alarmingly still view of the future, which turns out by association with the regularity of her visage and framing, to have been a kind of mouth-speak statism from the near past. In other words, the viewer feels trapped between the past and the present, in a present which is merely an absurdist repetition, and you can do this for other works of the same period by him, one which indeed seems not to change. Water presents a particularly clear use of a framing device, and a procedure which could from a Euro-American standpoint, it would be similar to, say, Andy Warthol. Uh, or it could have been borrowed from a non-Chinese video arts brought into China in 1990 by a German video artist, which Zhang Peili at that time had not seen. At least, we haven't seen any argument that he had seen them. He said he didn't. The person who saw the, G the German video works brought into, G into Hangzhou in 1990 was Chiu Zhijie, by the way. And other arguments are possible about him. So to see such simple transfer and assimilation, see borrowing in, in the light of a simple kind of reflexive translation of another art culture or art, would in, ignore the whole Chinese history of repetition, going back to at least the Qin, according to Lord Taleda or anyway, um, would ignore the whole Chinese history or, of repetition of the blocked or enclosed language which we're familiar with in the portrait on the right, of mouth speak and the use of mouth speak and then the images which are associated with it for propaganda purposes. And the only way Jean Pelli has got to handle that is to resist it coldly, to show it coming back on itself again and again and again. And as you can see very, quick, very clearly in that context, in that relation to images, uh, originality and formal teleological expansion of the discourse is just irrelevant. It's not, uh, not necessary for a Chinese artist to engage with that. The problem with, with Zhang, Zhang Peili is that assertions are made about his work as a kind of retrospective construction of different positions in European modernity. And particularly in video art, taking the specific case of video art, but he'd never seen any until he went to America in 92 or 93. Uh, he saw a few things then, and, but he'd, he'd already done four works by the time he got there. So, you know, the argument that he was reconstituting European modernity doesn't work if he's never seen the, moder the modernity that he's supposed to be recapitulating. Um, and that's only a contemporary art form of another argument which is very important to face, which is that we know that colonial modernism was a modernism. It relativized the past. It relativized it through the frame of what was brought over from by often very inadequate or inferior artists or very poor artworks from your America. But it relative, did re, colonial modernity was a relativizing feature and carried with the uh, institutions which reinforced that relativization, such as the modern art school. It might surprise you to know there were four modern art schools in the 1850s in India. Four, not one, not zero, as in Indonesia, but four. So there's a lot going on under the surface of the transfer argument, which is worthy of inclusion in an archive, but also worthy of more serious thought. For example, Fabian, who's an anthropologist and therefore aware that he's talking about how we see other people as they see us, uh, in, discussed four concept, conceptual categories of time. Physical time, mundane time, which we've seen, typological time, and intersubjective time, which are rather different. His major argument, Fabian's major argument, is the, 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 the denial of coevalness in time, being in the same universe, between anthropologizing and anthropologized cultures, 
privileges the former against the latter. For Johannes Fabian, I quote, somehow we must be able to share each other's past in order to be knowingly in each other's present, in italics, in the original. The idea, and this is a few, frequent argument in art history that, that, that we're dealing with heterochronicity or achronicity or something from a European point of view. Well, that's, that only tells you that the European point of view is wrong. In other words, it's not non-interpretive. It doesn't give you any more meaning other than the system projects on the other side. The idea that somehow one's, one culture's chronos produces or defines another culture's anachronos sets aside, or a, a acrony, uh, sets aside the, histi- the issue of hegemony over the culture's rules. What is different is that spatial distance and separation may enable some cultures to tell stories of their own, which stand outside the hegemonic culture's time sense, or chronos. All cultures may be achronological to each other, or have a part of their cultural expression which is achronological, if their relative structures of hegemony are separate. And of course the technological control are separate from the technological control, which permits this distance structure to allow it. And other European scholars, European specifically, anti-fascist German scholar, have argued that the problem with the transfer, and this is a, worth thinking about, although I'm not quite sure I agree with the terms of this formulation, but never mind. The, the, the problem in the transfer of Weimar Germany to Nazi Germany is one that things were buried in everyday life, in the structure of values, in the structure of habitual thought, in Weimar Germany, which were essentially feudal or reactionary throwbacks to a much, much earlier period, and they hadn't been satisfactorily enlightened. That uh, the past was somehow buried in the present and catching up with it. I'm kind of skipping forward a bit here, but I think that's probably necessary. So, how temporarily are we to define the contemporary in Asia, temporarily, in time? And what are the consequences of the, the gap, if we don't? These definitions are, in fact, no longer about art discourse or art work, but are based on political events and institutional changes, at least, for example, in the case of China and the Philippines. And then the question arises, when does the contemporary start? How are we defined? Well, Wu Hong, a great Chinese scholar, says the caesura for the contemporary are the events of 89, the China Modern Art Exhibition in February, the non-art event of the Beijing Massacre in June, and the rapid economic development which followed Deng Xiaoping's move to the south in 1992. So basically, in a three-year period, the contemporary arrived in China through these external effect of these ex- external events. Another scholar who's present, perhaps already with us, Patrick, Patrick Flores, says the contemporary is marked from a shift by a shift from the artist to the curator. So here we are. We're, we're thinking about the functions which allow a radical shift in time by time perception. Uh, He says there, there's an impetus for postness. The turn, I quote, the turn against idealization and the drift towards the liberation of everyday life from exoticism (coughs) through the re-engagement with reality and the break from the institutionalization of modern art that it be affected by an independent curator at Biennale's. We see this in various Asian cases. I'm not, I know two, at least. One is a Malaysian case and one is an Indonesian case. And Patrick noticed also in another article that the dis- disruption of the modernist continuum that buttresses modern art history in the West, the, actual dis- 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 the breaking up of this linearity in Western modernism, allows or frees a space up for an alternative schema of the contemporary. The contemporary actually starts by the breakdown of this previous quote unquote modernist system. Patrick further notes that the curatorial gesture could have emerged from a self-reflective in, in, instinct of conceptualism. It gave rise to a discursive disposition, the desire to interpret, to craft a tale, to name a phenomenon, 
and to muster our examples to sustain arguments to, and muster I repeat the last phrase and muster examples to sustain arguments what do we do in archives do we just list up the works well the, the very most important thing with the archive is to make sure everything's in it there needs to be sure what the conceptual scheme is which organizes the works and then of course as Patrick's indicating here to muster examples to sustain arguments the function of the archive for contemporary art practice is actually how it is arranged so it sustains arguments about art selection is very important then selection which we can see operating in an Indonesian artist I, I use this example because it's particularly clear which relativizes and delegitimizes as past or passed on those previously established media already in the archive. So the archive is actually a deconstructive exercise as it takes place. Then time and its concepts serve as markers of presence in new discursive spaces and as the indicator of the periodicity of sequence. They show us what happened before what or what was contemporary with what happened at the same time as what. Time also serves as a marker index of causality in the generation of art objects. Time privileges the directionality. And given that teleological models of the modern have lost their status, everything's got some purpose to invent a, a new form of position, by, by, this, by their perpetual reference to the past, marker index is, have also worked in a quasi-modernist way by enjo enjoining revaluation of new and old monuments as reference points for current practice, by changing the content and the scope of the archive. Now you can see that the painting on the wall at the back, after the portrait of Raudan Saleh by uh, Baer, which is actually in Riga, in the Baltic, still today, has been changed by his paint over painting with the, um, I think the butterflies, if I remember rightly. Uh, the winged insect creatures, which he's looking at, um, has indeed has the transfer of Ryan Saleh to uh, the driver's seat in an anachronous um, car. Uh, Ryan Saleh almost certainly didn't drive a, uh, even an, a, a very early automobile. And we see this kind of play with anachrony and then relativization of devices also in lots of Chinese art. I may, in my view, tediously, I don't like this piece at all, but um, I'm using it as a phenomenon to indicate how temporal narratives are related to one another. And of course, this uh, juxtaposition here, like other juxtapositions one can make with early Dadaist works, mostly by Duchamp and contemporary practice in various Asian countries, points, the prop points directly at a problem of the contemporary which uh, we haven't really theoretically come to terms with. And there's no reason why Huang Yongping shouldn't quote Dusan if he wants to. But the problem is that it's a work which is already 100 years old, old when he does it. Now, by the way, 100 years is usually the period given for taking things out of the Orsay and putting them in the Louvre. It's 100 years, is, or, or in, in Japan, uh, taking things uh, out of uh, the Museum of Modern Art and putting them in the museum, the Tokyo National Museum. It, it, 100 years is history. So why should contemporary art have such a privilege to play with history for its own references? What is there about artworks as images, which is different from artworks as objects in a lineage which are made somehow as the successors to one another? It's a really difficult problem, and I don't think we've ever come properly in close to it. This is due to the time of the local discourse, but the local discourse on the left is in no sense local, it's transnational. It's the local context in which it's shown is, but the work itself not, I, I suppose. And you see many cases of localized uh, appropriation of transnational discourses in time, and often requires a huge range of uh, archival references for inter uh, a necessary historical ref interpretation to grasp what is inner and what is outer, what is endogenous and what is exogenous to this artwork. Um, 
The interfaces of culture are really problematic. How much time have I got? Anybody got the time? I haven't been looking, so you'll have to tell me. 10.26, another four minutes? Yeah. Um, let's kind of try and sum up a bit. Uh, we have internal, that in, in modern art worlds, from the 1840s, even in Indonesia, with artists we've only just recently incorporated into a, 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 a corpus, a, a, an archive of what is modern in Indonesian art, um, are all subject to the problem of internal and external dynamics. And the consequences of this switch between internal and external in temporal sense for the construction of art histories. And this problem will not go away. It's something to do with the sovereignty of the art historian, something to do with the sovereignty of the audience which receives contemporary art. It's something to do with, we can have that art too if we want it, and put it in a place which has got nothing to do with whatever was the case in France in the early 19th century, early 20th century, as you can see that 100 years ago. So the, the slightly facile, the slightly, oh, well, let's do a Duchamp with a you know, nine-story building, which is what that is, um, this, it, that becomes a question of the position of the Chinese artist. It's not a question of the historical irrelevance of doing the procedure that he's engaged with, or what one in the past would have called a historical res, re, irrelevance. I have thought, my, me personally, I have thought that the solution for many difficulties is to conceive an internal and external causation, the endogenous and the exogenous. But the question outside Euro America is one of the use of temporal sequences to map endogenous causal series with which they are not cognate in interpretation, however much their external form. This is like a paradigm case. Do you, which set of criteria are you going to apply? Which separate set of time concepts are you going to apply? Is it going back to the everyday life? Is it going into a blockage, which is suddenly repeating itself in a loop? In understanding the temporal intersections of internal and external dynamics, there seems to be no way out for the enforcement in practice of a discursive coherence by a hegemon, usually called the discipline of art history, which is usually external to the works involved, except, of course, for individual artistic creativity and origination functioning, we hope, with some degree of relative social autonomy. But these problems occur all the time in the Asian modern. You might say it's the constituting feature of it. To sum up, cultural context is not unidirectional and is not a site for mere Euro-American projections. There are also counter-projections from non-Euro-American frameworks, each with their own temporalities. Saying one or the other is achronic only means their time is not our time, however constructed. For the purposes of establishing an Asian modernity, which is at least, and should be more than, the sum of all the Asian interactions and constructions, the Asian side is actually more important than the Euro-American side. In fact, the binary is irrelevant and should be dispatched somewhere to a suitcase of history. Time and its concepts serve as markers of presence in discursive spaces. Temporality serves as the indicator of the periodicity of sequence of adjustments and as a relative index of causality in the generation of art objects, which then can be included in the archive for comparison. They have no absolute or generalized descriptive power, I suggest. Adjustment and innovation between different Asian art sites is subject to the simultaneity and different differential periodicity of these causations. No temporal unity can be presumed without demonstration of periodicity in different cultural contexts. Analogous phenomena such as the rise of modern art schools and the exhibition structures that go along with them, the fine art societies in India all functioning around art schools by the 1880s, for example, there's four fine art societies going, I think, by the 1880s. Uh, the institutional base then um, subjects us to different considerations of onsets and terminations. There are some astonishing uh, synchronicities between, for example, colonial India and uncolonized Japan in the 1880s to 1910s. And they're very unlike the similarities or dissimilarities between China and Thailand, for example, 
after World War II. In short, and to finish, the structure of periodizations could be relatively similar across cultures, but the actual historical duration may be very different. Uh, like in ordinary clock time, I should say, probably there. And works act actually placed in the archive for the purposes of comparison may appear to be anomalous when, in fact, they're very interestingly linked. But the problem of archives is you have to, to say what is the anomaly as well as what the norm is. And very frequently, both of those questions are allowed to sort of quietly fester at the bottom of a pile called too difficult or the national or something or the cultural or the religious adhere to in a particular place. When we have truly established a set of those changes in their different Asian contexts, we will have established a paradigm set for Asian modernities. And it is this whose comparison with Euro-America will allow a redefinition of modernity in art and all its myriad temporalities. Thank you. By asking the audience a question, uh, could you all put up your hands who saw Cubism in Asia? Or Asian Cubism? Or, or everybody saw it, could they put their hands up? The, so, so you can go on, just, uh, uh, I, I the, yeah, so, uh, Li Ti Zui, no. Oh, Matt Mill. It's your modern. Nobody. Nobody. Oh, that's very strange. Okay, yes, you might. Yeah, and no, I was going to ask you a second question then. How many of you realized, had seen the pair of Rioza paintings, which are nearly in the, painted in the same year? One is, over, you had, of course, yes. <laughs> but uh, I showed that to you. <laughs> so what we're dealing with here is we don't actually know what our art history is in Asia because we haven't looked at it. We've done national studies, we've done a few comparative, you know, very poor, in my view, very inadequately organized thematic exhibitions around cubism or uh, what was the other one? Realism. But we haven't really, we haven't really actually begun to do the work that we should be doing. Okay, uh, first, thank you very much for <coughs> your talking. And I think the, um, should we open to the audience for the question first? Yeah, uh, 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 Pair that you showed. Um, okay. okay, thank you. Um, I, 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 I was really um, happy to see that you sh you showed those and that you asked this this question because I think it's a really very pertinent one for um, our study of of modernity and, and modernism. Um, and I think part of the issue is that um, for for many of us who look at modern Asian art, there, there's an uh, assumption that work um, in ink on paper is all sort of part of a uh, undifferentiated traditional something or other. Whereas if you, if, if you look, at, look at this painting on the right from, um, from any kind of cursory knowledge of the different schools of Japanese painting or whatever, you, you immediately see that it's just totally like wild and wacky and out of uh, out of the ordinary. So, so I I I think um, part of what we need to do a better job on is to um, e explain the um, the the critical criteria that existed within the Asian cultures to everybody so that the radical changes that are seen in paintings like this can be better understood. You know, you see the same thing in, in China with Liu, Liu Hai Su's um, contemporaneous work in, in ink and oil. And you, you see people uh, criticizing him for 
painting ink paintings with the brushwork of an oil painter. And then some of his supporters um, saying, well, that's exactly the point. That's what his originality is. And, um, and, and so these kind of c contentious um, issues, I, I think, really uh, um, lend themselves to, to more um, explanation. I, I think it's, this is a great pair that you've got here. Yeah, I mean, we could, have, yes, you're quite right. We can find Chinese examples. Um, we could take the Rambonian case and go into that in great detail. As various distinguished scholars, but much more better qualified than I am to look at have done. Um, but the, the situation uh, essentially uh, changes with the modern state. And it's very interesting that we should have this early, and there are other Japanese images which we could put up here from earlier periods, with the modern state, with nationalism with the discourse of we, the state owns our culture, which is our people's culture. Um, and heterodoxy, unconventionality, wild eccentricity, as you called it, um, the, the, these, are, these are values which either are opposed to the state or which the, the state really doesn't like. It really doesn't like it because it's out of control. It's out, anything which is out of discourse is somehow problematic for the state. And this is simply the rather minor artistic variation or example of it. Standing against that is the privilege of the invention. And it's only certain Asian cultures, and Japan is certainly one of them, which have allowed the artist that wild eccentricity, even as they oppose it, sometimes in its public expression or exhibition. Because the artist is a legitimate, licensed thinker about the future which we're all going to live in, which we're all going to somehow grab everything in the past and put it into the future, which is undistinguishably, uh, inalienably ours. And intellectuals in Japan had that function. It was quite clearly recognized by the state from really from this period, from the early 19th, early 20th century. Um, now, we know that this power of the intellectual to speak truth to power, or to just to speak truth about their everyday life, which is usually their topic, it's not power itself, it's ways of looking at their, their own existence, um, has not been given to artists in all Asian cultures, or only given to those artists who, because of the complexity of the state, because of the variety of inherited discourses from the past, obviously the Indian case is very clear in this, are able to work in a way which the state doesn't approve of. But we know that the, 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 the return of the religious repressed is a universal phenomenon. Sometimes it doesn't take the guise of a belief in a particular religion, it takes the, the guise of a belief in a particular ideology. Um, but um, some of you may be familiar with the case of M.F. Hussein, a Muslim painter who painted Hindu gods in uh, various kinds of uh, lyrical expressionist, quasi-abstractionist, large paintings, which were attacked by fundamentalist mobs, Hindu mobs, uh, and resulted in M.F. Hussein not being allowed to stay in India, going to the Middle East, and then actually he passed away in London. He's buried in London. Um, so uh, the return to the sacred is another problem which the state, as a hegemon, as an organizing body which integrates forces in the, in the culture to its own advantage, um, very clearly employs. I think that's enough. Yeah. No one tell you. I have uh, uh, two questions, and firstly, I will um, speak in the English, and then I will uh, to make a very brief summar summarize uh, so to summarize your question in Chinese, so that to make sure my questions can be understood by the the audience. So um, the first question is to the speaker: um, Can you uh, explain a little more about the reason 
uh, if we take reason seriously, behind your comparison between these pictures. And this, another question is to all, all uh, maybe I, 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 sh I would like to set for our uh, conference. That is, how can we avoid the following situation? That is, the development of the archive in new forms become another way to um, reaffirm the Western subject, to reorganize the non-Western to the world led by the Western world. Um, the uh, new form, uh, the non-lineage non uh, time or multiple times perhaps can become an other uh, way of organization uh, to uh, rise a new ideology in a so-called post-ideological world. Okay. Uh, 再多一点解释一下他去做对这些作品做比较的选择多元现代性这种概念去把一些非西方世界或者是非西方现代性的国家和文化重新卷入一种西方主导的意识形态。Your uh, first question can be applied in almost every Asian culture. Why do we look at these contrasts? What's the reason for it? The reason is that it upsets the um, um, monological quality of what is our modernity. Um, and that's why Japanese scholars, have in, without necessarily making this explicit or making it their main intention, have done this. It's because they understand the variety of forms which constitutes modernity. And I suppose my main reason is uh, a kind of hostility, irritation with the idea that we can understand the world in terms of a modern and traditional binary. Because I don't see the modern as separate from the traditional. I see that, in fact, I think that you can very clearly demonstrate in many Asian cultures that the tradition is an invention of the modern. That what was habitual or customary or accepted as normal practice in pictorial discourses before a certain point then becomes valorized, becomes authorized, first of all by artists, then by patrons, then by the state, as ours or significant. So it's a way of saying we're not going to go down that road of putting the modern and the traditional in opposition to each other. Um, having interviewed artists, uh, a large number of artists across different Asian cultures for a long time, I'm very well aware of this issue. And um, I'm aware that some people make choices about presenting themselves as traditionalists when there's hardly anything traditional about their work at all. In other words, a kind of political or propagandistic point by the artist. As to your second point, which is a very serious point, it's very likely, um, as you can see with the activities of the art market, particularly this year in Hong Kong, uh, that. Um, at the micro level of the art world, some forces are in play and some persons seeking to profit by the movement of those forces will try and re-establish or, re, um, or, or redeploy a kind of Western hegemony over art through what they define as worthy of discussion or how they define, think it should be discussed. And the same argument can be made about um, certain kinds of ideological structures. These are by no means only those of liberalism, by the way, or market liberalism, as it's sometimes called. They are found very widely among Western intellectuals who think that you can only have postmodernism if you've actually had a leg legitimate and original kind of modern modernism, um, which is a way of saying 
it, your discourse has got to operate in terms of the model or we're not, we're not going to pay any attention to it. And we're certainly not going to bother to spend a lot of time finding about, 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 your, about your art, modern and contemporary art, and we're not going to even bother to learn a language that you speak to speak with you about it. Um, we could have had this conversation in Chinese, Japanese, Thai, I suppose, um, just about. Um, so, um, to some extent, the ideational, the valuational, the linguistic discourse of Western moder modernism is not a language subject. It's free of that. You've only got to go into a room with, oh, I don't know, people, artists, what have I done? Artists from Africa talking to people too, from Brazil, not having a, a mutual colonial language, with a, which would have been Portuguese and speaking to each other in English. I don't think the language is important. I, what I do think is the, in, the new institutions of domination are being re-established and their ideology is buried in their actions. It's not an explicit ideology, but it's certainly there. Uh, very obvious case is, is Ai Weiwei, you know. A really rather poor imitative artist of Western modernism is being given this kind of position because of his political values, which, ones with which, by the way, I agree. Um, but that agreeing with an artist's political values does not account for why the artist is given prominence by a particular kind of system. Uh, there we are. Any more? One more? One more question? Quick now. Coffee time. No. <laughs> if no more questions, maybe I ask a question. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, I think very interesting bring, uh, it's so good to bring this kind of concept and the term and the culture citing uh, into the uh, definition of the modern Asia and also the Asian modern or on the uh, Asian modernities. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the developed, I think the, almost the entire uh, Asia, no matter which part of Asia, the developed the modern art in its own process. Or, and the strong impact of the Western art. So, when we're talking about the, trying to, uh, you know, emphasize on the, uh, the, uh, the local discourse and the cultural setting in Asia uh, to uh, establish a new kind of framework when we study the modern Asian art. Uh, you know, this conference is about the archive. So, uh, I just wondering, you know, what kind of role this kind of uh, the existing archive in Asia can help us in this process. The most uh, large the challenge is what? Yeah, I mean, the problem. Sorry. I agree this is an important issue because the archive is the, the set of works from which you establish datum points in your construction of the past or your reconstruction of positions which other people have established in the past. And you can see that, as you would probably, as we, I can see it anyway, in your own work on, you know, from late Qing China. I mean, this is, this is not the way a late Qing scholar uh, would reconstruct Chinese modernity in, 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 in terms of artworks. So it's a question of what goes into the archive. The problem is that, or the, the problem and the richness of art history now is it has available to it the whole range of imagery which is not of objects which have been sanctified by, uh, either by a, or canonized by um, a normalizing tendency in art discourses in the past. There's no, tr there's no necessity to having Wen Renhua as representing co contemporary China. There may be a way in which it can do that, um, and there may be a way in which it formally expands itself by that, be but, but there's no necessity for that. Um, and also, you can see that the whole expansion of our visual world, the technological and material and volumetric expansion of our material world, since photography, of which the digital is only the latest extension thereof, since the middle of the 19th century, means that things which we wouldn't have seen in the past even if it's down to the lowly objects in the artist's studio, which there is now a photo record, uh, would um, would be seen, would be available to visual analysis and comparison. So the vision, 
the whole problem with, with, with contemporary archives in, in Asia is that the archive has to be extremely comprehensive. The notion of the art object applied to it um, will in, in, inevitably restrict it uh, to um, things which we already consider to be art. And this is true of contemporary art. For example, there is a, I can't remember his name, is a famous Korean sculptor whose uh, work I quite like, but don't like the amount of prominence that's been given, but never mind. Um, who I interviewed in his studio in Seoul 10 years ago or so. And it's full of little plastic models. Little plastic models of sculptures which, you know, he's thinking of for toys or for the toy industry or something. Alongside which he does his big sculptures for public parks. And I realized that if I'd just gone to his work via a notion of the fine art object or the art object which I've seen in Biennales all over the world, actually, you know, I would not have understood his relationship to his visual material, which is there in his studio. And it's a bit like, you know, when you see, oh, I don't know, paintings of European salon painting exhibitions, and you don't, instead of seeing paintings on the wall in a row, the whole bloody wall full of pictures. Was it on the first row? Was it below, above the line or below the line? Which room was it? Um, all those kind of questions you could ask about salon paintings in which art historians somewhat tediously have gone on asking. Um, you could only ask if you had seen a picture or you got a diary entry or you read Diderot's reports on the French Academy, uh, the French Salon Exhibition. Um, so we are, in a sense, relying on the archive to include a lot of collateral material. This is the problem, which is visual. Now, we all know that our categories for the handling of any material are intensely problematic methodologically. They can be political, they can be religious, they can come from you know, a particular historical construction, they can form a, re a relation of support or antipathy for the state, whatever is the organizing power. Of the so we have to, I mean, the, the problem of the archive is that it makes us conscious of what categories we use for including or separating material or giving privilege to certain materials, relating, creating a meaningful relationship between works, which can be contemporary, they don't have to be in a periodization partic particularly. Um, but we get, then we've got all this work which we have to look at or at least have to think about because it's available to us through, basically through photography. Um, in the past, the, the, the paradigm comparison here is probably um, Svetlana's, Svetlana Alpers' book on Rembrandt, where she discusses Rembrandt's series of, is anybody Dutch here? I can't remember what they're called. It's a particular name for these small self-portraits that he did in the studio where he acted certain emotions and tried to record them. And the whole series of these pictures, you can find them in any of the standard books on Rembrandt. Now we know that that series exists. We know that it's a non-normative, uh, non it's, it's, it's a local use by the artist of the source of expression. So we can reconstruct, because we've included in the archive these informal or uh, non-iconic pictures, non-canonical, non, non sorry, non-canonical pictures, we then be, were able to think about these big, larger pictures, why they had certain emotionality, why they had certain kinds of expression. So you, in the past, what we've done is we've reconstructed the archive, what should be in the archive, from peripheral material, in sec either in minor works or in secondary works like prints and so forth, or in verbal description. And now we have, for lots of artists, we have almost a complete visual field available, and then of their society at their time. You know, if you think of, you can think of it, I mean, an artist working in Seoul in the 1990s, well, what's his visual world? Well, you can take, there are photographs that exist. I've been to his studio, I've got pictures of the toys on his wall. You know, so there's a lot of material you have to include. Then the question comes, how much of this material can you afford to ignore, or how much of it should you ignore? And 
I mean, there's a, the whole problem for Chinese art history is enormous because there are these two huge periods of interaction with Western art. The uh, late Ming, early Qing, and treaty port paintings. And all this work is, is somehow seeping out into Chinese, a very constricted, a very narrow, um, in some ways very articulate and pleasurable, uh, if you know how to read it, like the one of the, the song paintings at the um, Kenlong Southern Trip paintings at the Google in the moment. Um, but there's a big but here. Um, they are only due to the kind of questions we ask of the images in the archive anyway. I mean, the, the whole of Chinese painting history changed when Sullivan, in 1973, in a, in a symposium in Taipei, said, oh, I'm sorry, said, Okay, well, let's look what was in the library, the Jesuit library in Beijing. And he, I mean, it's a very primitive thing to do. He actually denoted what was in the library. And he said, hell, there are all these illustrations of Western cities, late Renaissance illustrations of Western cities. Aren't these having an effect on lists of great late Ming painters who followed European landscape conventions? And then Cahill took that much further and more interestingly followed it through into to the early Qing. So there are, there, we've seen this done in art history already. Now, if you take a, a, an artist um, who does pop references or works with a certain kind of colouring now, you'd ask yourself, where, did that, where, did, where does that sensibility come from? And maybe this reason is one of the, 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 the fact this, this kind of subterranean almost linkage to popular culture is why artists who I actually loathe, like Tabaimo and so forth, and Murakami, why they're so interesting to non-art people. Because it seems to be to do with everyday life, to do with the re and, and these and people who like Murakami or Tabaimo actually see these visual influences in their own environment, that, so they can make the linkages which might otherwise have to be theoretical or art historical. And those works wouldn't be in the archive. I mean, all those toys, you know, certainly there's a Japanese collectors of very impeccable collectors of toys from the 1950s, but these space creatures that accompanied the early, early science fiction series on, on, on Japanese TV, they're all collected. But, you know, you'd, you have, you'd have to actually put those in your brain to think about certain artists' work in the 1950s in Japan. Thank you. I think uh, uh, we were told the time is up, so we have to stop here. Thank you very much uh, for listening, and uh, thank you very much, Professor Clark.